forgot it. First service. My name is Mike Souter. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace. It's good to be with y'all. Growing up, we had two ponds on our farm. The one pond was supposed to be there. My dad actually dug it out himself with a bulldozer to make a, a lake for us to swim in, put some bass and bluegill in to fish. The other pond was not supposed to be there. It was on the edge of what we called the church field. And each year, this rogue pond was growing bigger and shrinking the adjacent hay field thanks to a few troublesome, fat little creatures. Anybody want to guess what they were? Beavers! Cute little destructive beavers. Now, I actually like beavers. I like to watch beavers in the National Forest, out at Elkhorn Lake, up in Maine, anywhere but on my own property. They can be a real nuisance on a farm because beavers like to drop trees, good trees, in your fields, across creeks to destroy your, uh, your water source for your cattle. They just need to go, okay? Any PETA people here today? I, so I remember my dad taking me along to set some traps one day, not live traps, but the old school, rusty, this is your end type traps. And I distinctly remember him warning me. He said, now you have to be very careful at this last step because if you mess it up, you'll trap yourself and maybe break a couple fingers. And then he took this stick and he jammed it right in the middle of this set trap. And I'll never forget the sound of that trap snapping the stick in half as it closed. If you're not careful, the traps you set will end up trapping you. So today we'll look at a time when that happened to a group of men. Not farmers, but Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders in the time of Jesus. This is one of the most powerful stories in the scripture and I don't care if you've heard it 50 times already, if you will humble, humble yourself enough to listen to God and for something, I guarantee you, he will speak to you. It happened near the end of Jesus' time on earth, about three to six months before he was crucified. The setting is Jerusalem, the capital city of the Jews. The Feast of Tabernacles is taking place another annual week-long party for the Jews. Jesus sends his disciples on ahead, and then it's almost like he changes his mind and shows up halfway through the festival and spends his days teaching in the, in the Jewish temple. This is no small thing because at this point, Jewish religious leaders were getting a lot more fine-tuned in their plan to have him killed. Last week, we looked at a passage that was in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And today we're going to look at one that is just recorded in John chapter 8. And I have to note, you may see a little, a little asterisk in your Bibles that questions exactly where this passage fits and when it was written because it's not recorded in the earlier manuscripts. And I, I dug into that a little bit. And all you need to know is it was in the original canon, the original scripture we all use so it's legit. Just take, take that for it. All right, here we go. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 2. At dawn, Jesus is an early riser, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all of the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, 
Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then again, he stooped down and continued to write on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, interestingly enough, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. I'd like to look at this kind of a little, little section at a time. But let's first pray briefly. God, we, we have to hear from you. There is no way we're going to live this life you've called us to if we don't hear from you all the time. God, would you speak your truth into our hearts and our minds? Would you honor people's presence here in this room, watching online? God, would you change us? Would you make us more like you today? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to go a little section at a time. At dawn, Jesus appeared in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. This is one of the reasons the Jewish leaders hated him so much. All the people gathered around him, meaning not them. So he's a threat to their power. He's a threat to their egos and their corrupted traditions. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees bring in this woman caught in adultery and they make her stand before everybody. These people don't care about her. They don't even really care about the law. If they cared about the law, which is primarily love, they would have done this thing privately in some way. In the law, one of the men continues, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? They're using this question as a trap. In the same way that someone had used this woman for sex, the Pharisees are using her as a tool to try to trap Jesus so they could legally accuse him. I mean, he does seem to be in a real bind here. Because if he says, go ahead and kill her, well, now he seems cruel, and he seems to be going against everything he had been speaking and teaching and showing the people about love and kindness. Not to mention, if he did that, he would be arrested by the Romans. But if he said, let her go, he would be seeming to reject the sacred law of Moses, which, by the way, he taught on every day, and he'd be accused of blasphemy, which would be clear grounds to be killed. So this seems like a, a, a pretty good setup they have for him, except that their approach gives them away. Let's see how the law of Moses they were referring to actually reads. This is Leviticus chapter 20. This is, what, this is the law they were referring to. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. If a man commits adultery, it begins. Man is listed first, as men more or less always are in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament. Why? Because men, in this time, were the ones with the primary responsibility for everything that happened outside of the home. Hmm. Okay, so we have the adulteress here, but where is our adulterer? You don't have to be like a sex ed teacher to know it takes two people to commit adultery. Where is the guy? That's what most of us are asking when we read this for the first time. We're like, where's the guy? We get hung up on, we find ourselves always 
caught up in these little controversies and missing the whole point. You know, Jesus could have called them out on this. He could have said, bring in the guy and then we'll talk. But he knew there was this beautiful opportunity here to show something redemptive and he wasn't going to miss it. Jesus bends down, starts writing on the ground with his finger. He does this weird thing. There's been a lot of speculation, tens of thousands of pages written about what was he writing in the sand that day. Was he writing the names of people? Was he writing the sins of the Pharisees, starting with the older ones first? That's why we're like, no, I'm good. I didn't mean that. We honestly have no idea what he was writing in the sand, and it doesn't matter. What he says is what matters. Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone. He's brilliant. He's always brilliant. He doesn't reject his law. By the way, don't forget, he, he wrote the law. He doesn't reject the law. He doesn't soften the law. He doesn't ignore her sin, which we'll see in a minute. He takes this calculated risk, and admittedly, it is kind of a risk. He takes this calculated risk, and he tells them, go ahead. If you're perfect, go ahead and do it, which, of course, they're not. Clever. Jesus is so clever. At this, those who hear it began to walk away one at a time, the oldest first, till only Jesus is left with the woman standing there, and he asks her, woman, you know, it's like, this is just hitting me now. The Pharisees are all standing there. He can't give them a time of day. He's looking at the ground, right? All that's left is this woman. And then he stands up and honors her. Has no one condemned you? Where are they? No one, sir, she says. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus is an expert at so many things. But for the few minutes we have remaining, I want to look at the way in which Jesus is a master at turning things around. What was Jesus' primary message when he came to earth? He talked about love. He talked about, he talked about hell a lot. He talked about money. He talked about the kingdom all the time. But his primary message always began with what? Repent. Turn around. You're looking in the wrong direction for the life you were created to live. It's over here. Repent. Turn around. He turns traps into doors. He turns defense into offense. He turns brokenness into beauty. First of all, he turns traps into doors. There's a pretty good chance that the woman here was a married prostitute. If so, in a town of 25,000 people, that was the size of Jerusalem at this time, everyone would have known her. She was an easy trap. And if so, she likely got into the profession of prostitution not by her own choice. Most people don't aspire towards prostitution. Hey, I think I'll be a prostitute. She got somehow trapped into that. Whatever the case, she is trapped and there is no easy way out of this thing. But then, fortunate for her, odd as that is, a mob brings her to Jesus. In a, in a different sort of way, this story perfectly mirrors the story of the men who make a scene bringing their friend to Jesus to be healed. Isn't that ironic? Remember that story? The guys bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus. And in this case, these Pharisees are bringing this woman paralyzed, sort of trapped and stuck to Jesus. And what did Jesus do with the guy who was paralyzed. He healed him. Yeah. So her current, he turned her current trap into this trap door to rescue her from this horrible situation and potentially a lifelong 
trap she was in, and he can do the same for you. Some of you here today, I think it's a fair bet, are feeling trapped, stuck. You've tried every which way you know to get out of some horrible situation. And there just doesn't seem to be a way out. But Jesus would say to you, all things are possible with God. As long as you're breathing, there's a way out. Jesus went so far as to die to free you from hell. So I'm pretty sure he has the capacity to free you from all the little hells of life that we find ourselves in. If he can do that big thing, he can do it with all those weird little things situations you're in now and we have to recognize that these jewish leaders were legally justified in their arrest of this jewish person they were legally justified in their call for her punishment the way they went about it was all wrong but they had this legal technical right to call for this and jesus doesn't fight them on the legality of it and he didn't overlook the need for this woman to be punished, there would be punishment, there would be justice, and he would be the one who would take it on. Allowing himself to be arrested just a few months later, trapped with nowhere to go, allowing himself to have to stand before an angry mob of Jewish leaders, half naked, probably like this woman was, he took the punishment of that woman, and of all of us on himself. The book of Hebrews says there's no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. The forgiveness this woman experienced cost Jesus his life. He turned her trap into a door so she could be free, and he turned the trap that Satan set for him into a door for all of us so we could be free. So that's the first one. He turns traps into doors. Secondly, he turns defense into offense. He turns attacks from his enemies into attacks against his enemies. He somehow, he gets in between us and our enemies, which is what we call intercession. I remember a time in high school when a few of us from the country got into this near street fight with a few guys from the city in front of our local Kmart. And it would have been bad until my six foot six farmer brother-in-law appeared like out of nowhere, stepped out of his car and stood between our scrawny little group and that scrawny little group. And somehow it was all over real fast. This is what Jesus does for people in trouble. He puts himself in between. Here's this woman standing alone. Think about this. Alone. Caught in sin. All eyes on her. Probably half naked. With a mob of men standing around her with rocks ready to kill her. She's under attack emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And what does the first thing Jesus do? He doesn't waste his time with debate. He gets the attention off of her onto himself. He does this weird thing. He gets down on his knees. He starts drawing in the dirt. And he continues to do this same type of thing every single day for you. Paul wrote to the people of Rome, and we know that God works all things, even attacks from our enemy, together for the good of those who love him. So if God is for us, who can be against us? Who is there to condemn us? For Christ Jesus, who died, and more than that was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, interceding for us. Do 
He's interceding for us. He's intervening for us. He's getting between us and our enemies, turning the battle against our enemy. He began this encounter in defense, and he ended it in offense, pointing out the sin of her accusers. They came to shame, and they left us shame. If we walk with God long enough, every judgment that is launched against us will eventually backfire. I'd also note, he doesn't actually need our help in pointing out all of the sins of everyone around us. What if we think about this woman as the culture? It's pretty easy, right? She's wrong in this area. She's wrong in this area. The culture is wicked and all. It's, it's pretty easy. What he's looking for are people who will intervene, who will get in there, and who will pray for people who can't live right. They can't live right without Christ in them anyway. We can barely do it as people filled with the Holy Spirit. He's looking for people who will pray for the deliverance of people. He's looking for people who will ask God to show them, point out my sin, God. This is how the psalmist David prayed. Point out my brokenness, my weakness. Point out my wrong thinking so I can live different. God is looking for people who will love people in such a way they will eventually say help me out here <laughs> are we going to be that or are we going to just stand and be like look at how evil people are he turns traps into doors he turns attacks into intercession he turns brokenness into beauty he turns our shame into redemption now he doesn't make light of this woman's sin he doesn't suggest that sexual sin doesn't matter anymore oh that's just an outdated law that adultery thing we don't worry about that anymore it's not he doesn't do that he tells her explicitly leave your life of sin repent and he forgives her why so that she's empowered to live right that's what he does when he forgives us he's simultaneously giving us the capacity to do right to live a completely different lifestyle now we can't be sure but there's a good chance this woman that he saves her life is Mary Magdalene Mary Magdalene this sinful woman who later washes Jesus' feet with her hair and her tears and the most expensive perfume money could buy. Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who sat at Jesus' feet becoming Jesus' closest female disciple. Mary, the incredibly brave woman that when all the other disciples left, what does she do? She goes and she stands at the foot of the cross as Jesus is hanging on the cross and she attends to him like this. That's who we're talking about. Mary, the woman who is the first person Jesus chooses to reveal himself to when he comes back to life. From embarrassing shame to incredible honor. From brokenness to beauty. Kind of makes you want to have Jesus expose all of your sins too, doesn't it? If that's what happens. If he gets it all on the table and what it results in is a life like Mary's. <sighs> Go ahead, Jesus. Let's just get it all out there so I can live the life you created me to live. Monday night, Matthew Fulmar, one of our elders in training, and I were sitting chatting about this passage, and Matthew said something. It was so powerful. I said, wait, wait, say that again, and I had to write it down. He said, we need a revelation of how our fear of being exposed 
keeps us stuck and blind to the fact that it's in God's goodness that he wants to expose our sin so he can heal us. How about we quit hiding? How about we quit pretending that everybody else is sinful, but at least I'm not like them. How about we quit pretending like we got it all together? We're choosing to stay in a trap when we do that, y'all. How about we go to Jesus, we voluntarily admit our sin, we tell him the areas we're stuck or lost or messed up in any way before somebody else has to do it for us. Matthew also said, you know, the guy who got away with it, the adulterer who didn't make it to the party that day, that guy actually missed out in a huge way because he didn't get a chance to encounter Jesus. He didn't get a chance to be forgiven and transformed. You never hear anything about that guy. Oh, but he got away with it. He didn't get away with anything. Remember Jesus' purpose for coming to earth. I've come that they would have life and life to the full. He wants to expand your life. And the only way he can do that is if you'll say, yes, free me, God. I'm wrong in all these areas. Help me out here. I was talking to somebody yesterday. We did a, a sermon uh, a couple months ago. We talked about the exponential fruitfulness of wheat seed. That if you plant a wheat seed, currently, thanks to herbicides and pesticides and Roundup and everything, that little seed will produce a hundredfold. You get a hundred yield. And if you plant all those hundred, each of those will produce a hundred, and you'll get this extravagant yield planting wheat. Why is it that we don't have that kind of yield with our life? I think it's because we hide out a lot. I know it's true for me. But we're not supposed to live like that. We don't have to live like that. If we would go to Jesus and volunteer to him our broken areas, and if we would get around other people, a few safe people, and we would say, I am missing it. I am messing up in this area. James says, book of James, confess your sins to one another so you might be healed, so you could live wide open. It doesn't have to be complicated. You just start talking to God. You just start thinking about what you did. And then you say, God, you see all that I was thinking about? Will you forgive me? Will you help me? I just love how Jesus takes everything the enemy meant to mess our lives up and he somehow turns it in a way for us to live the most amazing lives possible. Will you say yes to that? Will you reject the invitation from the enemy to be a victim? Can we stand? I'm going to close this in prayer. Um, can we have our ministry team come forward to pray? Maybe a few small group leaders. And I just want to encourage you, if there is any area in your life where you feel stuck, be brave <laughs> and come forward. We're not going to have you on the mic or anything. Just come forward. Let someone pray with you. If you're watching online, go to someone you can trust. Or contact us through our app or through the Connect thing. Let us know how we can pray with you and serve you. It's the key for your freedom. I'm going to read this prayer of closing out of the book of Jude, towards the end of your Bibles, and then you're free to go. We're, um, I don't know how, we're ending a little early. So if you have kids that are in children's ministry, hold out a little bit. 
take, take a rare five minutes and sit in your seat and reflect on this or come and get prayer. This is from Jude, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless, perfect before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. That's the purpose of it all, of it, y'all. That Jesus would get more glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you.